dreams forevermore. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living, a casual look into the Word of God with the preaching ministry of Dr. Gary Bradley, minister of the Mayfair Church of Christ, located in Jones Valley in Huntsville. The Mayfair Church is a loving, Christ-centered church with a vision and a dream of sharing Jesus with the Tennessee Valley and the entire world. Every Sunday, Gary touches people's lives with the good news, and now he wants to share it with you one-on-one. So join us for the next few minutes as together we find the solutions to life's problems. Are you searching for those answers this morning? We believe the answers are there in God's Word and that each of us can have the abundant life God wants to give us. He reigns And now your host, Dr. Gary Bradley. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living. Happy Mother's Day. This is one of the most special days of the year. And there are two or three reasons. Number one, we, we need to express, if we can, our appreciation to our mothers. And because everybody's had one, you can't be born without one. So we've all have or had or have our mothers. And so this is a good day for us to express our joy. And even though my mother passed away in 1992, um, I find myself talking about her all the time because she was such a strong personality. She was such a, a people person. Uh, she I often said she uh, talked eight days a week, you know, and my daddy just grunted every once in a while. But when daddy spoke, everybody listened. But mother was a powerful influence on not only my life, my sister's lives, but so many other. The grandchildren just worshiped her. And uh, so it's a very special day for me, and that's the reason I'm going to preach this special lesson. It's about a mother and a grandmother. And of course, I was blessed enough to have a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother in the home at the same time. And I, I have such fond memories of those three, but we'll talk about that in a few moments. Right now, because I taped the pro- program earlier, I'm in North Carolina, about 25 miles west of Asheville, in a congregation of about 50 members. And they're the only church of Christ in the county. And so I've been up here since Friday night. We've met with the elders, and then we talked about how do we close the back door? How do we keep people once they are members and once they are in the family of God? How do we keep them? And then today, this morning, we're talking about Acts chapter 2, opening the front door. And I enjoy talking about healthy churches grow. Unhealthy churches don't grow. Just like a healthy person grows, a healthy child grows, a healthy plant grows. You know, I love to, I love to plant roses. And uh, I, I learned a long time ago, you, you dig a $15 hole to put a $5 rose in it because it's got to be done just right in order for those roses to grow. And so a healthy church, a healthy church grows. So that's what I'm doing now, and I want your prayers. And I'll tell you more about Cuba, about some of the things we're trying to do down there. The men, you know, I didn't go this time because of my hip surgery, but uh, they came back, and there's some needs down there I'll tell you about later on. But right now, I want to talk about mothers. The Bible is so unique in that the Bible is filled with all kinds of people. Uh, The Bible is filled with good people, obviously. The Bible is also filled with bad people. Like Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. So what Paul is telling the Romans there is that if you read the Old Testament, and I, you know, this is on my mind because three weeks ago I asked the church in Lone Cedar about their faith, our faith. The people that I know that have strong faith, that had strong faith, who are now passed away, Bible scholars, uh, members of the church, preachers, mothers and dads, people that have strong faith are students of the Old Testament. 
they read those examples and they follow the good examples and they avoid the bad examples. When I talk to young people, I talk about Joseph. Oh, you know, the one, the coat with many colors, you know. Uh, Joseph is, is one of the most Christ-like people in the Bible. There are more similarities between Joseph in the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament than in the other two. And so there's so many examples, like in the Old Testament we have, we have Jochebed, who was the mother of Moses. And the fact that uh, she was able to take care of him until it became impossible, and then she hid him in the river, and she told the sister to watch, and Pharaoh's daughter finds him, and the mother comes in and says, that's a Hebrew child, don't you think he ought to have a Hebrew mother? And so Moses then grows up for the first 40 years in Pharaoh's house. Whatever happened to mother? The Bible doesn't say. But then the next 40 years he's in the wilderness, and then the next 40 years he's leading the children of Israel. Another wonderful example of a mother is in 1 Samuel, the first chapter. Her name's Hannah. Hannah didn't have any children. And I try to remember that on a day like today because sometimes Mother's Day is not just like Father's Day in a few weeks. Uh, it's not as... Uh, pleasant for some people as it is for others. Uh, there are some who wanted to be mothers, but were not able to be mothers. And I understand that, and the Lord understands that. But you can still have a tremendous influence on people's lives. But in the New Testament, when you talk about mothers, of course you have to talk about Mary. Uh, that's the first one that comes to mind, because the Lord appeared to her after she became pregnant with a child, and Joseph knew he had not committed sin with her, and the angel told him not to put her away, not to, not to be ashamed of her, not to uh, embarrass her, because this is an interesting verse. What's conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And so you know the story of Mary, and you know that evidently Joseph died at an early age, because after the incident in the temple in Luke chapter 4, we've not, we don't hear of Joseph. So Christ then was the oldest and not the only one. He had brothers and sisters. And so Mary was the last at the cross and the first at the grave. And so when you talk about Mother's Day, uh, you've, got to, you've got to appreciate the fact that the Lord selected this little Jewish girl and uh, there's been so much speculation as to how old she was. Some think even as young as 14, 14, 15, 16 years old, whatever. We don't know. But the Lord selected her to be the mother of Jesus. And uh, if you see the movies, you know that how she's de always depicted as one that's behind the scenes. And, uh, but yet you read in the Bible about her. And she's a wonderful example of mothers today. But I want to notice the one that's just kind of mentioned as Paul is writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Now this is his final letter. Uh, these, are the, as this, this, the, these words are the only ones we have left. He's in a prison. He's going to die before long. He knows, he says... Uh, uh, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Chapter 4 of Second Timothy is one of my favorites because it's so personal. He says to Timothy, come to me before winter. Uh, it's too dangerous for you to travel in the, uh, uh, you know, in the winter time. And then he said a very sad thing. He says, Demas, my fellow worker, my fellow preacher, my brother in the Lord, he's forsaken me. He's fallen back into the world. He's gone back into the world. He's no longer working for the Lord, living for the Lord. And so Paul just brings out some personal things in 2 Timothy 4. And, uh, but it's, it's just one of the great books in the Bible. But this is so special to me because he just mentions it, but it's so powerful because he tells why Timothy... You know, they worked together about 15 years. Paul met him on the second journey. The leaders of the church said, 
to Paul and Silas, here's one of our young men, and uh, I think he'll make a good servant for you. Well, he did make a good servant for him. But Timothy, evidently, well, you read First and Second Timothy, and we'll get to it, but today is being such a special day, I just wanted to remind you of what the Lord says here through Paul. First of all, he says, I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience. Night and day I constantly remembered you in my prayers, recalling your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy, and I have been I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, Here's the, the point. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Wow. Look, look at the things that he said, and look at to whom he gave the credit. He relied on the, here he is in jail, here he is in in prison in Rome, but he's able to write letters, he's able to receive visitors. When we study the book of Philemon, we'll find that Philemon was a Christian, a rich Christian. Uh, he owned slaves, he owned uh, a home, and the church met in his home. But one of the prisoners, Onesimus, ran and stole some things from him. And uh, he made his way to Rome somehow. And while at Rome, he ran into Paul and uh, Paul's influence. Paul could receive visitors, but he was also chained to a Roman guard. And every four hours, those guards would be, cha would be changed. One would leave, another one would come in. But Paul could write letters, he could receive people. But he couldn't go anywhere because he was under arrest. And so he uh, writes this, these two letters to Paul, uh, to Timothy. And in this last one, he says, I thank God whom I serve. We're never more like Christ and Paul and the people, the good people in the Bible than when we serve. You know, serving is getting to be such a rare thing. Um, but it's such a blessing. And, and when we don't let people serve, when we don't encourage people to serve, then they're cheated out of a blessing. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Are you a giver or taker? Uh, unfortunately, if people aren't taught better and they don't want to do any better, they're just takers. They just, in a marriage or in a business or in, in their personal life and in their family, just well, everything belongs, I come first. Let me get in line first. And so he says here that uh, I thank God whom I served as my forefathers did with a clear conscience. And then he said, I, remind, I remind, remember you in my prayers day and night. Now, that's not to be taken literally, obviously. Or he, either that, it's, it's to talk about how completely he remembered Paul. Like in the book of Philippians, it says, pray without ceasing. Well, you can't drive your car down the interstate and be praying. Maybe you should, but, uh, you know, he's not talking about praying, praying all the time. Being in a frame of mind. Not being in a place where you're ashamed to pray. How about that? Pray constantly. And when I talk about something, just this is a figure of speech, like I'd say, I tell you, I worried about that, or I was, I, I was concerned about that day and night. That is, it never left my mind. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what Paul is saying here, is that, Timothy, you've never left my mind. Timothy had a problem, and we'll get to it in a minute, and it was the problem of timidity. Um, 
he, he was, Paul is writing this to encourage him, and he does so in a beautiful way. He says, as I remember you in my prayers, recall, first of all, recalling your tears. Now, here's where the mother comes in. The mother teaches by example and by word of mouth transparency, uh, emotions. Um, I remember your tears. What were you pray? What were you crying about? Um, when have you seen a man cry? Men are not supposed to cry. Is an old adage that's unfortunate because uh, crying is a blessing. Crying is a way of getting an emotional out. I've dealt with with people all my life, and uh, I encourage people to cry. And they, I've, I've dealt with the criers and the non-criers, and I'll tell you, those who can cry and do cry get over whatever they're dealing with much quicker than those who can't cry or don't cry or are not allowed to cry. And so we, we get our emotion, we get our transparency, we get our our um, uh, uh, ability to relate to others from our mothers. We get our example from our dads. We get, um, you know, when I think about my dad, I think about his love and his patience, but I think about how hard he worked. This was years ago, as you can imagine. He was a welder, and in the, in the Second World War, he we lived in Pensacola, and he he would be let down in, in, the be, in the belly of a ship and weld all day long. And he would come home and the sparks from the other torches would, would blind him. And I'd meet him at the road and lead him home because he couldn't see. And so when I remember my dad, I remember how hard he worked and how much he provided for the family. But, but you get... You get your you get your ability to relate. Uh, you get your transparency, and that's that's a word to to be able to get next to it. Uh, there, <clears throat> you, you get this from your mother. She teaches you. Uh, she holds you. She loves you. She cares for you, and uh, she corrects you when you're wrong, and she helps you and encourages you when you're right, and so. Uh, Timothy could cry. And Paul says, I remember your tears. I long to see you. But he never did. We don't know, when he wrote the letter, he said, come before winter. We don't know if Timothy made it or not. Because Second Timothy is the last word we hear from Paul. So he said, I long to see you so that, that I may be filled with joy. Sometimes when we see people, we're not filled with joy. <laughs> Sometimes joy bringers are not in our lives, and that's unfortunate. We ought to be joy bringers. And he said, "I have uh, reminded. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois." Uh, again, the reason this is so dear to my heart is because this was the way it happened in my family. But my family, it started with my great-grandmother, and then my grandmother, and then my mother, and then us, and the faith that was in them. Notice what kind of faith. The Bible talks about strong faith, weak faith, but the Bible here talks about sincere faith, the word sincere means without hypocrisy. And I guess everybody's familiar with the word hypocrite. Because it's, it comes from a word that means actor on a stage. It comes from somebody pretending to be something they're not. And I guess the ones in the Bible that received more condemnation like this was, would be the Pharisees. Uh, you read Matthew 23. 
The Lord talks about the Pharisees. He said, you're hypocrites. You, you wash the outside of the bowl, but the inside is full of decay and corruption. You don't clean the glass inside. You don't clean yourself inside. Outside you look nice, you dress nice, you wear scriptures on your on, on, on your sleeve and, and you have a bandana on and it's uh, the Word of God and you walk around a, a Bible but you hate the Gentiles. Uh, you're a hypocrite. And that's the word. Sincere faith is the opposite of hypocritical faith. We sing, oh how I love Jesus and don't mean a word of it. And so that's the reason Paul says when I Pray for you night and day. I remember, <coughs> excuse me, I remember your tears. I remember what you cried about. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, what, what would you cry about? Jesus cried three times. He cried at the grave of Lazarus in John 11. He cried over the city of Jerusalem. When he said, uh, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, they that stoneth the prophets and killeth them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but ye would not. He cried over Jerusalem, and then he cried in the garden, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And sweat fell from his brow as drops of blood. The, the book of Hebrews talks about his crying and groaning. And so, what do you cry about? Evidently, Paul says, you cried about the church, the condition in people's lives. You cried about that which you care for. I think that's quite obvious. And so, he says, I want to thank you for your sincere faith because you went to one of the best seminaries in Jerusalem. <laughs> no, no, because you have a Ph.D. in religion. Uh, no, uh, <clears throat> because you have such a good mind you memorize the Bible. No, I want to thank you for your sincere faith which first dwelt in your grandmother. Boy, that's going way back. Your grandmother... <clears throat> Uh, Lois, and in your mother Eunice. You know, there is a transition, there's a transitional action that goes on. In other words, I need to believe what I believe because the Bible says it. And I am just blessed beyond measure that my mother and my grandmother and my great-grandmother believe the same thing. I, I, again, I was talking a couple of weeks ago to a church, and I said, every Sunday, the preacher preaches to four generations. And there's never been a bigger gap between these generations than now. But there's one thing that all of us can agree on, if we will, is that the grandparents and the great-grandchildren both love and believe the Bible. Now, if any one of those generations happens not to believe the Bible, then there's no agreement, obviously. But when those of us who are grandparents and even great-grandparents hope and pray that our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will grow up studying the... This is what breaks my heart when young parents decide not to go to church, not to worship, uh, according to the New Testament pattern, not to worship. And they do other things on Sunday. I was reading some material this past week how that in the last 10 years or more, church attendance has gone down because people don't go. Uh, the, the work, they give a number of reasons. Uh, the the works, uh, workplace is so stressful that when the weekend comes, they got to go somewhere. And that doesn't always mean to worship. And so then when the mom and dad doesn't go, the kids don't go. And that's the thing that we found when we had the bus ministry years and years and years ago. We would drive by the neighborhoods and we would pick up children that wanted to come to Sunday school. They wanted to come to church. Mom and dad didn't. 
and some of them were able to change their lives because of it, but a lot of them just dropped out because we never got to mom and dad. And until you get to mom and dad, until you get to grandmother and great-grandmother, uh, that's not going to be the place that it ought to be. And so on this Mother's Day, let's do a little soul searching. Let's think about if I'm, <clears throat> I'm a grandfather, I'm a great-grandfather, and can my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren look at my life and can somebody say, I thank my God for your faith that first dwelt in your granddaddy. And then also in your dad. And so there's a passing of the torch, as it were, not because they believe it. A lot of people are what they are religiously because mom and dad were. Well, that can be right or it can be wrong. It depends on if mom and dad followed the Scriptures, if they searched the Scriptures daily to see if the things said were so. That's the important thing. So then it's wonderful to have godly parents like I had. Uh, but I had to chisel out, and this is very important, I had to chisel out my own faith. I had to make sure that what I did was what the Bible says, not because mother and daddy did it. And I have dealt with people for 62 years, and uh, one of the most difficult things to try to get over is most of the time people do the very best they know how to do. But when you get people into the Word of God, and you get them to follow the Lord, like Joshua 24, 15, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether it be the gods beyond the river but in whom you now dwell. But as for me and my house, there you go, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And so mom and dad served the Lord, so the kids served the Lord. And so then we, our authority must be the Word of God. And when grandmothers and mothers have sincere faith, and then in verse 7, if they teach their children the, and the, uh, to be strong, and the word power there means uh, inner strength. It means inner strength. If you, if you have a spirit of a strong inner strength and of love, and then one of the most important of self-discipline. There are three kinds of discipline. Self -dis parental dif uh, discipline, self-discipline, and God-discipline. And it really starts out great when it's parental di di uh, discipline. Well, Happy Mother's Day. Thank you for watching. Lord willing, I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Abundant Living, a ministry of the Mayfair Church of Christ. A place where children are loved, where families are strengthened, where teens learn to serve, and grandparents are special. Mayfair, truly a family place for all ages. The Mayfair Church of Christ, we're saving a special place for you. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come.